Amen. Well, this morning we are going to begin our journey through the Gospel of John. And this is the biggest undertaking that our small little community church has done. We have gone through the several books so far, Ephesians and Philippians and Ecclesiastes and Touched and Judges a bit. But this is the first time we're going through a gospel and the first time we're going through such a large book. And so we are incredibly excited. So let us begin by starting in perhaps an unlikely place this morning. Let us begin in the back of the gospel of John. Now normally you would say we would start in John verse 1 chapter 1, but today we're going to begin in the back, the next to last chapter, chapter 20 verses 30 and 31. So if you have your Bibles or your study guides, let's open them up. If you have our scripture journals, we'll be on page 120 and we are going to find ourselves there this morning. So John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. So these are the words of God written by John through the power of the Holy Spirit for us this morning. Words read this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. Instead of John giving us the overview at the beginning, he goes through and shares the gospel, he shares the good news, he shares what we are to know about who Jesus is, and at the end, he says, listen, I have shared these things with you so that you would know that Jesus is the Messiah of the Old Testament, the one prophesied. He is the Christ, he is the Son of God, and that by knowing this and believing in this, you will have life. And so he shares the big picture And so what is the big picture of the Gospel of John? John records and tells us that Jesus came and did many signs. He did seven that he recorded here in this Gospel. Along with seven times, Jesus was telling the people, the disciples, uh, the people in the, in the cities and the towns, that he is the I am, which is a phrase that was used of God himself, so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we will have life in his name. So John wrote all of these out for that specific purpose, so that we would believe. But before we tackle these great and profound signs and these proclamations that are put out in the Gospel of John, I want us to understand who is John. I want us to know if John is the person that we think he is. Is John somebody else? Or who is John and who is the disciple that Jesus loved? All right, so let's go ahead and jump in. So we want to know who John is, and we want to understand who is John and why did he write this gospel and what is the purpose of this gospel. So this morning, we want us to go ahead and start by meeting John, and Fred is going to put John up on the video screens for us. So here this morning, Eleni and Chloe, my two daughters, have decided to help us with uh, the visuals of our message this morning. So this morning we have John. Now that may surprise you because you're probably looking at this and saying, that's probably not what I thought John was going to look like. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, But here's the reality. The reality is that we do not know what John looked like. He did not tell us what he looked like. We don't know if he had dark skin or light skin or, or brown hair or black hair or brown eyes or a beard or stubble or maybe no beard at all. We're not told that, and I think there's a purpose behind that. Actually, we don't even know who Jesus is as far as what he looks like. The the gospel stories, as well as all of the Bible, does not share us that. But John actually, or actually in Isaiah, we get a, a glimpse, a view of what Jesus is to look like in one small sense. So if we look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, We see that Jesus had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Now, many of us have seen pictures that uh, depicted Jesus in our current culture, and he has the long flowing brown hair and the, the deep brown eyes gazing up at the sky with perfect complexion that looks like he's a model uh, for GQ or something. It's like, just looks amazing. But the thing is, is that the, the 
uh, writer of Isaiah says this. He says that he has no form or majesty. He says that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. And so this image of Jesus that we have created in our, in our culture, I think, takes away from the purpose. Because the point isn't for us to gaze upon Jesus. The point is for us to know what Jesus did and believe that he was the Son of God. It wasn't about what he looked like. He didn't look like a king. He didn't look like this uh, amazing Son of God. He looked very average and very normal. He was nobody that we should stop and go, that is the Son of God. But it's because what Jesus said, it is what he did, and it's who he was that helped us to see that Jesus was the Son of God. So as we look at John, we understand that we don't know what John looked like, and I think that's the point. And so we don't look and get sidetracked by John himself, but we are looking at what John is pointing to. Who is John pointing to, which is the most important? All right, now let's meet James, John's brother. So there's John, and now we have James. And let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. We'll have that up on the screen as well. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. So we see now that John, the apostle that wrote the gospel of John, that he had a brother, and his brother's name was James. And so as we see that, now we can look and meet the family. So John is the son of Zebedee. And we also know that he has a mother. His mother name is Salome. Now we know Salome is the mother because we can compare verses in the Bible. So if we do a little detective work, if you're into the CSI thing or, and you like to detect through the Bible, we can actually take a couple of verses together and put this together ourselves. So let's look at Matthew 27 verse 56. Matthew 27 56 says this, Among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So here we see James and John's mother. But we see them at the cross, and here in this particular scripture, in Matthew, we're not given the actual answer of who this is. But the parallel verse, which means the verse written of the same story, of the same account in the book of Mark, actually gives us more detail. Let's look at Mark 15.40. In Mark 15, 40, we see that there were also women looking on from a distance among who were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the younger and of Joseph and of Salome. And so the parallel verse, we actually get the name of James and John's mother. And so you may have actually noticed that there's two different spellings of Joseph and in here in Joseph's. Now, that doesn't mean they're talking about two different people. Oftentimes in the Bible, you'll see people have different spellings or different ways of saying their names. For instance, when my mother is really mad at me, she calls me Anthony in a very loud voice. Everybody here that are not visitors know me as Tony. So, uh, yes, I am Anthony. Yes, I am Tony. It just depends on where you're at and who's calling me. You'll have my name. So it's kind of a similar, not exactly, but a similar way here. So here we see the name of James and John's uh, mother, which is Salome. And so by digging further into the parents, we see that Zebedee and Salome were also very well off financially. Well, how would we know this? Well, let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 20. And it says this, And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. So as we're, we're learning about John, we see that John's father had hired servants. So oftentimes we see the story and we're like, Jesus calls for James and John and they get out of the boat and they begin to follow and poor Zebedee's back in his boat. And you're like, why would you just leave your father like that? And he's still got fishing, he's still got jobs to do. But no, Zebedee had hired servants. So to have hired servants during this time means that you were well off, you were able to afford to be able to do this. So it wasn't such a big deal for James and John to be able to follow. Let's see here. Mark 16.1. Let's go ahead and look at, at Salome. 16.1 says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. So here we see that Salome had the financial means to be able to buy spices to anoint the body of Jesus. So his father had hired servants. She had the means to be able to purchase uh, spices for the anointment. 
So with money comes influence, and with influence comes asking for things that the average person may or may not ask. And I find this story really fascinating. So let's look at what I'm talking about in Matthew verses 20 and 20. And it says this, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, who we know who she is now, came up with him with her sons, and kneeling before him, talking about Jesus, she asked him for something. Let's see what she asked. Matthew 20, 21. Asked this, And he said to her, this is Jesus saying, What do you want? And she said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand in your, in your kingdom. This is fascinating because here she comes forward and she says, here's what I want, Jesus. I want you to tell me that my sons will sit, James on one side, John on the other. And she's declaring it. Like, look at these words. She's declaring it because she knows that if Jesus says this, it's going to happen. And that's fascinating. It's like, what great faith that she has to just go boldly up and say, Jesus, listen to me. Here's what I want. This is what I want. And so she says that, but then let's see the response in verse 22. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. So we can see that rubs off on the sons a little bit. The confidence there, like we are able, we can do this. Well, let's look at the next verse, verse 23. He said to them, you will drink my cup. This is Jesus speaking. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. So she tried, two points for that, but that wasn't the goal or the purpose. And so Jesus says, no, that's, that's not it. But like I said, it looks like some of this confidence has rubbed off on John and James. So let's go ahead and look at Mark chapter 3, verse 17, as we're trying to understand who better John is. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. So Jesus gave them a name, like something as far as who they are, sons of thunder. So you'll find out in just a moment why that fits pretty good. But if Jesus were to name you, what would he name you? Like, what would he say about you? Do we want to know what he says about Because I was thinking about that as well. You're like, I don't know if I'd really want to know that answer. But we see here that John was very zealous and very ambitious. One of my favorite verses that John writes in his gospel is when they hear about the tomb And they hear about the stone that had been rolled away. And they're both excited. John is here along with Peter. So what do they do? They start racing up to the tomb. They race as fast as they can. And John points out that he beat Peter to the tomb. Like, that's pretty funny. Like, he's like, hey, we're racing to the tomb. By the way, I I got there first. And so that kind of tells you his zeal and his ambition. But let's look at another example. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verse 54. I think this will help us understand why he's called sons of thunder. And when the disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? What is going on here? You see, what's going on is the disciples were heading towards Jerusalem. Jesus had his eyes set forth Jerusalem. They're going through a Samaritan village during this time, and Jesus sends disciples ahead to make provisions for maybe spend the night, get food. And the Samaritan village rejects him and says, no, you're not welcome here. We're not going to give any of this to you. And so upon hearing that from the disciples, what they do is John and James come, Lord, Lord, do you want us to go all Sodom and Gomorrah on you? Do you want us to rain down fire? You give us the word, Lord, and we'll make fire rain from heaven. We just need your blessing, need your word. And Jesus rebukes them, by the way. That didn't happen. But you can see, like, what zeal. Like, they believe so well that they're like, look, Jesus, if you tell us to rain fire down, we know that we can do that, and we'll just rain fire down. And so we get the idea. It's like, all right, sons of thunder, I get it. So, but Jesus rebukes them, and we don't get to see that played out. Probably a good thing. So what else do we want to know about John as we enter into this gospel? We know that John was one of the closest disciples to Jesus, if not the very closest. And we'll get into that in here in just a minute. In Luke 10, there's no slide for this, but in Luke 10, we see 70 disciples that were sent out on mission. 
we also know that there were 12 disciples of Jesus called that were close to Jesus. And we see of the 12 disciples, three of them were in Jesus' inner circle. And so let's look at that. Mark chapter 5, verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And so in this particular situation, we see that no one was able to go with Jesus except these three people. These are known as the inner circle of Jesus. And lastly, we see that John was not academically trained, at least not to the outward appearance. John was not academically trained. Acts 4.13, let's see what that says. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, again, we don't know the uh, extent of his schooling and so forth. We know he walked with Jesus for a number of years, but it seemed to the average person, to the people who were looking out, that there was nothing special about John. So these are the things that we know with 100% certainty about John, the author. So as we're going through this gospel, this paints a picture. Give us an idea of who John is. But now I want to share the things that we're almost 100% certain on through church history. So the things I just shared, we are 100% certain on because we see these through Scripture. But this next part is not 100% certain, but we're pretty darn close. One is that John is the author of the Gospel of John. Now you might say, well, yeah, don't we know that already? But if you remember last two weeks, we've been reading through the Gospel of John. John never says that I, John, have written this letter like Paul does in his letters. We see actually he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. And so what's going on here is through church history and through the earliest writings that we find, it's almost unanimous that everybody associates this gospel with John. There's very little, if any, debate on this. And so while we do not have 100% certainty through Scripture, we are very confident that John is indeed the author and thus is the disciple with whom Jesus loved. And it's written in the account of the third person. Now, this means that not only was John in that inner circle, but it would seem that John was Jesus' best friend. Not only did he go in certain areas that only John, James, and Peter went, we see that intimate, close relationship, and John shares that by calling himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. We see at the Lord's table, it was John that sat beside Jesus and reclined against Jesus while Peter was on the other side. Let's look at that. John chapter, chapter 13, verse 23 through 24. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So here at the Lord's table, as they were getting ready to find out who Judas was going to be, as Jesus was going to be washing their feet, we see that we have John right here, and he's so close to Jesus, but he's being motioned to, which means Peter is not beside him. Let's look at the very next verse. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Talking about Judas. So here we see a beautiful, intimate picture of John leaning back against the chest of Jesus and whispering into his ear, Lord, who is it? Who's the one that's going to deceive you? Who is that one? And we can see the beautiful relationship that is happening here. Church history also tells us that John is the author, tells us that John was close to Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved, possibly his best friend, and that John was the disciple known by the high priest. Why is this important? This is where Jesus was questioned, and it's why we're able to have report of it. We also see that this disciple was able to let Peter in to the high priest's courtyard, which is where we'll find out that uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. Let's see this in Scripture, John 18, verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, and there we see it, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Now, again, remember, church history is what's telling us who that disciple is. So through uh, proclaiming this and sharing this and studying and learning this, we find out that this was John through that. 
So now we've looked at John through the lens of Scripture, the author of the Gospel of John, as the fullness of what we can see through Scripture. We've now looked at it through church history. Now I want us to look at it in a way that is very likely to be true, but we don't have 100% certainty on this. So in other words, you're welcome to be here this morning and not agree with this. When you hear this, please don't storm out of the building or the room. You're welcome to if you feel that way, but I don't think you need to. And I'm going to show you why I believe what I'm about to say. So the next part is, I believe that Jesus, or excuse me, that John was more than just the best friend of Jesus. I believe that John was Jesus' first cousin. I believe that Mary, Jesus' mom, and John was the nephew of Mary. I believe Mary was the aunt of John. So you don't have to believe this, but let me show you why I think this is and why it's very likely, and I think it helps make other parts of the narrative come together. But let's look at Scripture, because we must see this through Scripture. Let's take a look back at the crucifixion scene. John 19.25. So now we're back at the crucifixion scene that we saw earlier when we were talking earlier. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And so we have three Marys here, but we also have Mary's sister or Jesus' aunt. Who is this? Some say John is explaining that Mary's sister is also Mary the wife of Clopas, because we can see that. We have mother, his mother, we have his mother's sister, and then we have Mary the wife of Clopas. But scholars say that if you look at the way in the Greek that this was written out, that if that is what was being articulated here, it would have been written differently. But let's look at another case. If you, and this is not saying this is the most scholarly here, but if you had a daughter, would you name two daughters, Mary and Mary? Probably not. Doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. But the other part is, is then why would John make it so that he said his mother's sister and then continue with an explanation of who this is by Mary, the wife of Clopas? So scholars believe that more than likely that's not who John was talking about, that it was just his mother and his mother's sister. Well, who is this? Well, let's look at the very next verse. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Next verse. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took him to his home. And so we see, guess who was there? We see John. John was there, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And now who else then would have been with them? Well, as we looked at earlier scriptures, when it came to the cross, when it came to everything that was going on, we see Mary, we see Mary Magdalene, we see Mary of Clopas, but we also see who? Salome. We see her there. And so it makes a lot more sense that Jesus would tell his nephew or or Mary's nephew that, hey, come take my mother. That is now your mother. And mother, this is now your son. It makes sense because they were in a family already. So it just makes more sense. Again, you don't have to believe this, but I think if we do enough detective work, it's very likely, though not explicit. The other thing that makes sense is that John would have been incredibly close then with Jesus, being in the same family as Jesus. Now, we believe John was much younger, that he would be uh, possibly a teenager during this time, but it would make sense that John would have possibly grown up his whole life knowing who Jesus was, which makes sense why John and James would have been in that inner circle as John being the disciple that Jesus loved and then Peter being added to that inner circle. So again, it just also makes sense. But here's a quick question. Why didn't John just come right out and say that it was his mother? That's a common question during this. Well, I think the reason why is John doesn't come out and say who he is either. Because again, the point isn't letting people know who he is and who his mother is. The point is, is who is Jesus? Like, who is that? And so we can see this, and I think this helps us get a better understanding of who John is, but we must not miss the whole purpose. So now that we've given a fair amount of time to who our tour guide on this gospel is, who is John, and why he is 100% qualified to share this firsthand information, let's go back to our text for the day. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. 
Now let's look at this verse closely. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So let's begin with that first line. Jesus did many other signs. So we see that Jesus did many other things, that these seven that were written were not exactly everything that he did, but he did many, many other signs. As we see in the very last verse of this gospel, John chapter 21, verse 25, we see, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So we see this greatness of all that Jesus did. So these were not just the only signs. These weren't probably even the greatest hits of the signs. These were specifically chosen so that we would hear of them, and through hearing them, we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. These signs were picked out for one specific purpose. These were picked out so that you may believe. John, through the Holy Spirit's power and purpose, brought these back to John's mind so that we would behold the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's look at that verse continue in John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs. Where? In the presence of the disciples. Your faith can be strengthened because this is a firsthand account that you're receiving. Not only a firsthand account, but a firsthand account of possibly the closest person to Jesus. This is the firsthand account of Jesus' best friend to share this with you. But it wasn't just John who saw this. It was all of his disciples. We have accounts from Matthew, the tax collector disciple. We have accounts from Mark, who is disciple of Peter. Luke, the historian who is with Paul, who interviewed many eyewitnesses. And of course, we have John. So these signs were not done in secret. They were not hidden, but they were done in the presence of many. And also, these were done in the presence of the disciples. And these were just seven written, and there were countless other signs. Let's keep going. John chapter 20, 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So these seven signs are written so that you would believe. But what are you to believe? Are you to believe that Jesus is a miracle worker? Are you to believe that Jesus had supernatural talents? Well, it's much bigger than that. These are written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the one promised to ransom, to rescue, to redeem, and to restore. He is the God-man. He is the Son of God. He is our Redeemer. It's so much bigger. These were written so that you wouldn't just believe in him, but that you would believe who he is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. These signs point you not to the great things he did, but to the greatness of who he is. So we see the great things that he did, and it points us to who he is, and then what he accomplished for us, and then what we receive through the accomplished work of Christ. And so that's why these are so important that we see this. John wrote this so that as you see the signs, as you hear the stories, as you marvel at the supernatural, you'll see Jesus is not of this world because Jesus is the one who created the world. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Not that Jesus is the Father. John 1.1 1, 1 makes this clear, and we'll get to that next week. But Jesus is God. Now, it's very important. The gospel is abundantly clear, this gospel recording. The Gospel of John points to Jesus as the one who created you and me. This Gospel points out that Jesus and Jesus alone can physically and spiritually save us. Eternal life and forgiveness of our rebellion is found in no one and nothing else except Jesus. Let's look at John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me except through Jesus. You hear me say this all the time. Jesus is not a way. Jesus is not one of many. Here, pick your choice. And if Jesus works for you, praise God, amen. But maybe something else works for you. That does not exist in Christianity. Jesus is not a way. He is the way. But there is more. We see the signs. We see the witnesses. We see they point to and confirm that Jesus is the son of God. But why does this matter? Why does that matter? Because believing this 
you go from darkness to life. Believing in this, you go from lost to found. Believing in this, you go from aimless to purpose. Believing in this, you go from meaningless to meaningful. Believing in this, you go from alone to family. Believing in this ultimately takes you from death to life. John 20, 31, let's look at the end of that verse. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have, what? Life in his name. You become forgiven. You become adopted. You become family. You become saved. So what must you do to be saved? How is this yours? How do you seize this opportunity? Well, it costs something. It costs Jesus his life which we will find out more and more about as we journey through this gospel. But it cost him his life, and it requires the currency of faith from you. How do I earn this faith? You can't. But don't fret, because listen, this is the good news. This is why the gospel is good news. Paul tells us in Ephesians, it is a gift. It is God himself that takes the accomplished work of Jesus and credits you with his sacrifice. The currency of faith and the currency is given to you so that you may believe. But how do you know if you have this currency? Simple. Do you believe? Like, like seriously, do you believe? Now, I'm not asking if you believe he existed. Even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So it's got to be something more. Do you believe that he is not just a God, just the Son of God off in the distance, but do you believe that he is your God? Like, do you believe that? Do you believe that he is your hope and Jesus is your sacrifice? Do you believe when he says, come, follow me, and you, like John, get out of the boat or get out of whatever circumstance that you're in, get out of that, and you say, yes, Jesus, I am going to follow. Is that you? Are you doing that? Do you want to do that? There's no magic prayer. The sinner's prayer, friends, it's not in the Bible. I actually abhor the sinner's prayer, but let me explain first. Because people say it 20 times week after week, coming forward to the altar as if it's Christian mysticism that they come for. If I just say these words, if someone just repeats them to me, if I say it, then I can have life in Christ. And then two weeks later, it's like, man, I don't feel this. I got to have something else. It didn't work. It didn't, something didn't happen. I must not be doing it right. Maybe I didn't say the right words and there's mass confusion. And it's, it's problem is, is they're thinking that this is Christian mysticism and that's not the gospel. What we are supposed to be is like the man who in Mark 9, 24 falls on his feet and says, Jesus, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. There's something different there, something radically different there. If you say, I am a sinner and I love my sin. Let me be honest. We love our sin because we're fallen and broken people. I love my sin, but I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. I need your mercy mercy more than even the air that I breathe. I need this. And if that is you, then you have faith. You take this faith now and you place it upon the only one that is worthy of this faith. You place this faith that has been given to you upon Jesus and your sins are washed away. Your burden is lifted. You take the heavy yoke or the burdens that are weighing down you and you put on the light and easy yoke of Christ because he is the one that bore it all. But what about repentance? Yes, yes, there is repentance. But repentance is not what saves you, but is the first fruit of your salvation because we're not saved by works. But what to know, but if you want to know if, you're, if you are saved, are you repenting? Are you asking for forgiveness of your sins? Are you turning from your sins and are you taking hold of Christ? Do you find the value and the beauty and wonder of Christ more than your sins? Not that you're sinless. No, we are going to fight our sins till the day we die. And it's a constant battle. But are you warring against them? Are you doing battle? Are you fighting it? Or have you given up and given in and said, no, you know what? I'll take my sins. You can have Jesus. No, no, that's not the gospel. The gospel is, yes, you're a sinner. Yes, you're fallen and broken. Yes, you rebel against God. Yes, you do all these things. But Jesus died so that you can grab hold of him. And as you're sinking, as you're drowning, as you're gasping for air, you can hold on to him because he will never let you go. 
And so you just hold on to him. You just grasp on to him. You must have Jesus. Do you have Jesus? But you're not saved because someone led you in a prayer and you repeated words. But you're saved because you have a conviction of your sins. And you know that your sins are not compatible with God because you now have the Holy Spirit within you. You confess your sins. You turn from them. Absolutely. You pray and you tell God that you are placing his gift of faith in him because he has opened your eyes that he is God and he desires to have a relation with you. He loves you. He cares for you. He's gathering you to him. We are saved by the grace of God through faith, and both are a gift of God. Does this speak of you? Is this story yours? Is this your experience? Have you placed this gift of faith that has been given to you upon the only one worthy of it? Is that you? Do not delay. Do not put it off for one more moment. If you want to know more about what that means, come talk to me after service. I'll sit here, I'll pray with you, and I'll tell you all of the glories and wonders of God. But I want to close with this. I want to take a moment to tell you what faith is not. Biblical Christian faith is not blind faith. It's not blind faith. I hear these two words so often and many times from Christians themselves will tell me, oh, it's just a blind faith. You just have to believe. Sure, you don't know if it's true, but I just just believe anyways. Just believe. Let me tell you right now, Christianity is not a blind faith. Blind faith is a concept that is completely foreign to Christianity. Blind faith does not exist side by side with biblical faith. Blind faith is the opposite of God-given faith. Blind faith is no faith at all, and blind faith will send you to hell. Let me be honest with you, blunt with you. That is not faith. If you have blind faith, then are you really a Christian? No, because true biblical God-given faith is not blind. It is seen and it is experienced. Biblical faith is the sure and certain truth that the triune God created you, sustained you, rescued you, and repurposed you. It is the sure and certain truth of this. John is not writing these so that you can trust fall back into something. No, he's writing these things so that you'll fall into the arms of Christ because he is there. He will catch you and he will not let you down. That is true biblical faith. Stepping out in faith. You hear that all the time. I'm going to step out in faith and hope that it works. That's not faith. That's stupidity. That is not what faith is. And I hear it far more than I would ever like to. Has God shown you through his word that he is God or has he not? I'm not saying that you walk out of here with a swagger because God opened your eyes. I'm not saying that. Why? Because you did nothing to earn your salvation. Jonathan Edwards says the only thing that you did to earn your salvation was provide the sin that made it necessary for you to be saved in the first place. Like that's all that you gave to your salvation is your sin. That's why Jesus gets all the glory, all the honor. That's why it's his name that is great. That's why we stand and we sing his greatness is because it's all him. So it should humble us, not make us pride or proud. It should humble us like, God, you are so good. You are so amazing. So there is no boasting. If you have never rebelled against God, then there's nothing you need to be saved from. You're good. You can walk out of here and not worry. If you've never sinned, never rebelled against God, you've lived your whole life for him, you're good. Problem is, I only think there's one person that ever did that, and that's the one who died so that you could be with him. All of us, all of us need Christ. All of us need Jesus. John is not asking you to blindly believe. John is saying to you, God exists and you know it. The question is, are you going to suppress the knowledge and unrighteousness as we see in Romans 1 and tells us that our hearts are hardened and you're gonna harden your heart to eternal damnation or are you putting the gift of faith that you have received and placing it back upon Christ? Because only two things are happening at this message today. Either you are being strengthened to Christ or your heart is being hardened to eternal damnation. Only two options are happening. So are you hearing this this morning and you're falling more in love with Christ, seeing how amazing he is, that what he has done for you? Or are you rejecting this? 
John is saying, look. John's saying, see, believe, have life. I've given you an entire book that reveals who Jesus is. You no longer have to have blind faith, but you can have the true and certain faith of Christ. So, our journey begins. This is, this is the gospel of John. Our journey begins, and we're going to spend the, like, the next 56 weeks, like an insane amount of time, going verse by verse through the beauties and the wonders and the glories of this gospel that John, the best friend of Jesus, wrote this so that you can see these signs. You can hear him say, I am, that he is the God-man, that you can hear all of these, hear of what he is going to do to rescue you, and you can then rest in him because he has done the work that you can't and we're going to come here week after week hopefully not sweating as much as i am today but week after week to see the beauties and wonders and the glories of christ john is telling us to see what he saw john is telling us to hear what he heard and to heed the same call that brought him out of the boat to bring you out of wherever you are at today that same call is going out to you so that as you come forward to Christ, you will be with him now all the way through eternity. So be it. Amen. Let us pray.